So this evening, I just have a word that I just feel I want to encourage the entire church. You know, last weekend, Pastor Zhuang shared on the importance of understanding the seasons in our life. Likewise, we need to understand the season of our church that we are in right now. So tonight, the title of my message is Rebuild, God Remembers. Rebuild, God Remembers. Can you turn your Bibles with me to Zechariah chapter 4, verse 6 to verse 7? Zechariah chapter 4, and let's all look at verse 6. Amen. Zechariah chapter 4, verse 6 says, So he answered and said to me, This is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel, not by might, not by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. Who are you, O great mountain? Before Zerubbabel you shall become a plain, and he shall bring forth the capstones with shouts of grace, grace to it. Somebody say grace, grace. grace, grace. Amen, grace, grace. Now, this passage over here, it was written in a time when Israel was under the Babylonian exile or the Babylonian captivity. It was from 586 BC to 539 BC. Amen. So major prophets before, like Ezekiel and Jeremiah, prophesied about the 70 years of exile of Israel, that the Babylonian empire will come and they will rule over Israel. So during the Babylonian reign, Solomon's temple, or what is known as the first temple, was destroyed in 586 BC. Somebody say, wow. wow. The first temple destroyed in 586 BC. So let's, what, let's look at what happened. In 2 Kings chapter 25, verse 8 to verse 10. 2 Kings 25, verse 8 to verse 10. It says, And in the fifth month, on the seventh day of the month, which was the 19th year of King Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar, the captain of the guard, a servant of the king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem. He burned the house of the Lord and the king's house. All the houses of Jerusalem, that is, all the houses of the great, he burned with fire. And all the armies of the Chaldeans who were with the captain of the guard broke down the walls of Jerusalem all around. So it was a very tragic day for the Jews. If you continue to read from verse 11 to verse 21, you will realize that they took away all the articles in the temple, the pots, the pans, the basins. They took away even the priests and even the doorkeepers. They were held captive. And as they broke the pillars of the temple, they broke them because they were precious metals. They were made of precious materials and they took them away. So it was a day of great loss. It was a day of great loss to the Jews in the land. But more importantly, it was a day when the Jews could no longer worship God. Then in 539 BC, 40 years on, God delivered Israel from the Babylonians when the Persian army under Cyrus the Great. Somebody say Cyrus the Great. Cyrus the great. He was a great general of the Persian army and he overthrew the Babylonian rule. So King Cyrus, what was different now was that King Cyrus allowed the Jews to return to their land and rebuild the temple. And because of that, they managed to re-establish the worship of God. So in 538 BC, the Persian king appointed Zerubbabel. Somebody say Zerubbabel. Zerubbabel. Which we read earlier on in Zechariah chapter 4. Zerubbabel. Who was Zerubbabel? Zerubbabel was the leader of the tribe of Judah. He was a, he, he was a governor then, and he led the first waves of Jews back to Jerusalem. And that can be found in Ezra chapter 1, verse 1 to verse 2. And with the help of the high priest Joshua, Zerubbabel began rebuilding the temple. So Zechariah, when you read the book of Zechariah, you must understand that Zechariah is one of the minor prophets in the Bible. And he was a contemporary with this other prophet called Haggai. So we have Zechariah, we have Haggai, but they were prophets, so they were prophesying. But all this while, there was a historian named Ezra. Somebody say Ezra. Ezra, Ezra the scribe. What was the role of Ezra? Ezra, at the, at the same time, he was documenting the entire rebuilding process 
of the temple. So when you want to understand the full picture of the book of Zechariah, you need, to you need to read Zechariah, Haggai, and Ezra together. So in this service, I will try to give you a picture of what the rebuilding process is like. So things begin to happen. After coming back to Jerusalem, they begin to rebuild. But you know what? After two years, after two years, at this point of time, all they have rebuilt, the temple was only the foundation. That was all that was to it. The only, the temp, only the foundations were found at the temple site. So when they came after two years, they were expecting at least a little bit of a roof. But all they saw was the rubbles of the foundations. And it's just been rebuilt. So an architect will tell you, the height of a building is always in, in direct proportion to the strength of the foundation. So the taller you want to build your building, the deeper your foundation needs to be. Church, as we go through a season of rebuilding, Jesus is our foundation. Somebody say amen. amen. Jesus is our foundation. He is the chief cornerstone of City Harvest Church. But at the same time, we must not forget the key foundations that God has laid in the church through Pastor Kong, the pioneers that have sacrificed and have built to, to what is now known as City Harvest Church. We must not forget these key foundations that they have built. You know, last weekend, I was here at the 7 p.m. service and Pastor Ming was sharing the word. So he put up this photo of how they will pray before service. At 6.45 a.m., not p.m., 6.45 AM, they will gather to pray. Pray for what? They will pray for the service. They will pray for everyone that is coming into church. They will pray for all the newcomers. And after that, they will proceed to set up the hall. And then he began to share, Pastor Ming began to share. He was one of the pioneers during 41A days. That cell group meeting was one of the most exciting times during the week. That soul weaning was very much part of their lifestyle. And then Pastor Kong would have Bible study with them. And remember, he did the, the drum uh, example where Pastor Kenneth will play on the drums, raw faith, just wanting to pull the entire service through. And how the prophecy and the presence of God will saturate the entire meeting. I was, I was so touched. When he began to recall all these moments during his time in City Harvest Church, I began to recall my moment when I first stepped into church. And I remember when I first came to church, I was crying. I was crying during praise. <laughs> you know, I'm, I, I, I used to play rugby. I'm a rugby player. I think I'm a pretty tough guy. Liu Xue Bu Liu Lei. But when I enter into the auditorium that sits about 200 people, I, I begin to tear. I say, I say, what is this? Is it the aircon? Is that something that, that is in the air that I've never felt before. That year, if I'm not wrong, a revival that sparked off from our church. It, in my school alone, I think about 90 to 100 people came to our church. And I was one of them that came as a result of the people praying. We attended Bible study after, uh, after service every week. And I remembered when it came to Church Without Walls, I volunteered and I felt a draw to, to serve in the dialect church when I couldn't even speak a proper sentence of dialect. And I was going to be the song leader in the nursing homes. And that was the kind of faith that we had, that we knew that we wanted to minister and reach out to the people, to bring the presence of God to them. Friends, these are the foundations of our church. What are the foundations? There are five things that are part of our CHC DNA. Prayer and worship, ministry, evangelism, relationship, discipleship. Friends, even in the midst of our rebuilding, one of the most toughest times in the history of our church, let's not forget about these five foundations. Keep praying, keep worshiping, keep serving, keep reaching out, keep relating, building kingdom relationship in this church. Find a disciple that will disciple you, that wants the best from you. 
Verse 8 goes on to say, The silver is mine and the gold is mine, says the Lord of hosts. The glory, can we all read verse 9 at the count of three? One to, uh, together at the count of three. One, two, three. The glory of this latter temple shall be greater than the former, says the Lord of hosts. And in this place, I will give peace, says the Lord of hosts. How could it be? Isn't it a logical question to ask when the temple size is already different? They could not forget about the grandeur, how it was, it was so full and filled with the glory of God. Then how could it be that the latter temple's glory will be greater than the former? Remember, they were shouting grace, grace. They kept on shouting grace, 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 grace. As they continue to build, do you know that this proclamation will continue to the day of Jesus Christ. Why do I say that? Because in Matthew chapter 21, verse 9, the people came to the streets and they welcomed the Messiah with shouts of Hosanna, Hosanna. And how is the glory of the latter temple greater than the former? Because at this point in Matthew chapter 1, the King of glory himself he will walk right into the second temple, into the corridors and the courts of the temple. God, the Creator Himself, the Son of God, the Messiah, His presence will fill the entire temple. Let's give the Lord a big hand, amen. Hallelujah. Haggai's work was fulfilled 500 years later when love Himself stepped in when peace himself stepped in. Do you know at that time, the Ark of the Covenant was nowhere to be found because mercy himself stepped in. Friends, let's remember that God remembers us. As we build, we're not just building for the now, we're building for beyond the now. Philippians chapter 1 and verse 6. I'm coming to a close. If I can have the musicians to come up to the stage. Philippians chapter 1 and verse 6. It says this, There has never been the slightest doubt in my mind that the God who started this great work in you will keep at it and bring it to a flourishing finish on the very day Christ Jesus appears. There is never been the slightest doubt. As we rebuild this temple, as we rebuild this church, who knows we will usher it back the return of the King, the coming of Jesus Christ once again. Amen. Let's give the Lord a big hand. Hallelujah. Amen. City Harvest Church, don't give up. Don't give up. Don't give up because God remembers. Yahweh remembers. He wants to come and give us the word. He reminds us it is not by might, not by power. It is the work of the Holy Spirit. Celebrate the small victories among ourselves. It is okay. Everything is going to be okay. Because small things do become big things. One last verse for tonight. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 24 to verse 25. Pastor Bob shared this a few weeks ago. And I want to read this verse once again to you this evening. It says, let us consider one another. Can you help me turn to your neighbors and say, let us consider one another. Amen. <laughs> consider one another. To do what? In order to stir up love and good works not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as in the manner of some, but exalting one another and so much the more as you see the day approaching. Friends, God is an intergenerational God. You know, I, I, I came to church when I was 16 years old. This is where I got married. Now my kids are in church. One is 14, one is 10. God is an intergenerational church. And many of us, you know, we, we, we have second generation in the church right now. 
I have a couple in my cell group, they have a third generation, means their grandchildren are in our church. Imagine if they would have given up halfway. Imagine if, if they didn't stay. Imagine if the kids didn't stay. The grandchildren would have never a taste of our harvest kids. Friends, let us not forsake the assembling of ourselves. Let us not have any doubt in our mind that God who has started this great work in City Harvest Church will keep at it and to bring it to a flourishing finish. And everyone say, Amen. Let's give the Lord a big hand, Amen.